So the gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 49 to 56. Listen to God's word. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not know how to interpret this present time? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. All right, I would not have picked this passage if it weren't in the lectionary, right? (laughs) God, guide us. All right, we know it, there are so many things that divide us. We could popcorn a list in this worship service and the list would go on and on. We would name things like race and class and gender, political affiliation. There are the sports teams we cheer for and those we cheer against. There are zip codes and area codes, educational status, marital status. Some are dog people, some are cat people. Some like to binge on sweet treats while others prefer savory or salty. Some are morning people. Some are night owls. The list goes on. We are so aware of the things that divide us. I think I told you this story before. My husband and I are very much opposites. And so if he wants a sandwich to be made, I think, in which order do I want these, um, these items to be placed on a sandwich? And then I do the opposite, right? The mustard goes on the bottom and so does the cheese. I mean, what is he thinking, right? And so even in our old house, we know that we are different, and those differences are a part of who we are. The circumstances of our world seem to be holding a magnifying glass over those forces that separate us. Seems to be doing so not just in a way that makes those forces seem bigger, but this magnifying glass also seems to be directing the scorching heat from the sun's beams into the places of our lives where we feel the tension of those differences and almost inviting them to come to a boil. All you have to say is something like Mar-a-Lago or masks or abortion and feelings, beliefs, hopes, and ideals are quickly sorted into camps with a really big chasm between them. So then we come to church, and we want a little steadiness. We need a little steadiness. We need a reminder that God is with us still, and these schisms and rifts and divisions and turmoil will not have the final say, and then we get this. The lectionary I read for today, rather than offering consolation and support, Luke adds one big word to the list of what divides us. Jesus. Ugh. I'll be honest. I have known that there is a lot about Jesus that has divided us for some time. I've often talked about how I've grown up in a denomination 
that set strict ground rules about who may serve and how. And so having felt the sting of sexism within the church before even reaching a double-digit age, I could see how some people believed that Jesus was a savior who only called male disciples and sent them into the world to serve, while others embraced the inclusiveness of a Jesus who taught and ate and healed and sent out women. By the time I had reached high school, I had heard about the atrocities con committed in the name of Jesus, the Crusades, slavery, the Holocaust, and it was clear there is a lot about Jesus that divides us. Or maybe I should say it this way, there is a lot about how we understand Jesus that divides us. We pick denominations and congregations that reflect our own preferences. We use scripture passages to justify our personal beliefs, especially when it comes to hot button issues like sex or wealth or politics. We even use language about Jesus when we bless or curse someone with whom we agree or disagree. We're used to it. We try to figure out how to navigate these complicated forces in our world. We try to clarify terms like evangelism, prophetic, and even justice, knowing that these words so closely woven into the vocabulary of our faith have been used to harm and oppress for millennia. We study scripture, some even work on their own translations of scripture. We apologize. We explain that the God we serve is a God of love and a God of inclusive justice. We promise that God is still at work in the world even when we struggle to see evidence of God's grace. And then we read what Luke says today. Luke, the gospel that opens and closes with words of Jesus being the fulfillment of God's peace on earth. Luke, the gospel committed to telling Christ's story in a way that affirms that Christ brings justice and liberation and inclusion. And we read the words of our text today then that seem to tell us that it is simply human misinterpretation of Jesus that divides us, but Jesus himself. These words do not give me comfort, especially at first glance. They confound me and they make me a little uneasy and they sound like fodder for extremists who see destruction as the pathway to God's promised future and who see themselves as necessary agents of God's plan. But these words are in our gospel, and they're in our lectionary, and we're stuck with them. So we might as well see what they might have to say. Now, our passage for today is just one of a litany of tough lessons that Jesus issues in the 12th chapter of this gospel. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he knows that it will be in this city where he will face his demise. As his passion draws near, it seems that Jesus' teachings get harder to hear and start to escalate to a bit of a fever pitch, and there may be even, they may be even harder to understand. See, in this chapter alone, if you go back and read all of Luke 12, you see that Jesus has already called out the hypocrisy of institutional religion, the way believers wield, use faith to wield power. And he has warned his disciples in a series of cryptic analogies that Things will not go well if they are not prepared for the coming of the Son of Man. And then he shares the word for our lection today about division, not peace, 
about families split in two. Now, I am reminded, especially when I read commentaries, that this passage invites us to remember that Jesus' words are, and I quote, descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay, that means that Jesus, it is not Jesus' purpose to set children against their parents or parents against their children, but that this sword of rupture can be the result of the changes engendered by Christ's work. One commentator goes on to say that even a ministry that reconciles long-standing enemies will inevitably rend relationships that depend on the old status quo. So as we first heard in Luke's Gospel, in Mary's Magnificat song, Jesus will disrupt the status quo accepted systems that have determined worth and doled out power and served up wealth, systems that have picked and chosen some over others who have drawn those circles that have determined who is favored and who is on the inside and who is on the outside. Those systems are to be shaken up. Jesus did not come to keep things the way they have always been. Rather, Jesus offers us a lens that is a new way of looking at things. Things like faith and justice and power and how to be a good neighbor. And so as Jesus takes one step after the next to approach the Passover table and the garden and the cross, Jesus names in no uncertain terms that the path of discipleship is not always easy. It shakes things up. It causes us to call out the things that harm, but are the things to which we and others have grown far too accustomed. It calls to question beliefs that we once held as true. And it can even be outright disruptive. Sometimes disruption brings division, but not because God wants to pit people against each other, but because some people will easily fall into step with God's kingdom vision, while others hold on tight to the way things have always been. It will make some people uncomfortable to see those that they have gotten accustomed to viewing on the margins over there, up, front, and center. It will upset people to have their wealth devalued and their power upended. It will confuse many to hear that their habits and values and even their identities need to change. Not only because we need to freshen things up, but because the things of the past were filled with ignorance and suffering and hate and sin. Change is uncomfortable. Even if we were wounded by the status quo, it's often hard to move away from the familiar. And it can be even harder when there is pushback and fear and frustration and grief. And it is harder when people we love are simply not on the same page about the need to move forward, about the need to try something new, and about the need to let go. But Jesus reminds his disciples that even though it is hard, it is necessary work to open our view to God's expansive kingdom work. We need to stop and notice what's going on. To pay attention to things like unrest and suffering and to pay attention to injustice and marginalization and the ways in which we enshrine power and authority over the well-being of all. 
And we need to pay attention to a God who is active and engaged in the world God has made and present to, through, to humanity through humanity. One commentator writes, in these verses, Jesus chastised the crowd for their complete inability to interpret the divine activity now unfolding in their midst. The harsh sayings and indictments resounding in this text remind us that Jesus has not come to validate the social realities and values we have constructed. Such social realities and values have a propensity to seek harmony that favors those who hold positions of power at the expense of those who are powerless and expendable. Jesus' missional agenda of compassion and mercy and justice shatters the status quo. This is a missional agenda that compels him toward his divine destiny to be accomplished in his death and resurrection. As we notice the signs of our time, we see that our society too is in need of help. We see political polarization and a rise in extremism. We see the wounding of our planet, the wounding of the most vulnerable citizens of this planet through the enshrinement of maleness, whiteness, and access to weapons of war. We notice our own tremendous fatigue, our shorter fuse, our heavier reliance on caffeine and Netflix to make it through a day. And we notice that something's got to give in order for things to be set right. And we worry that it might be something we rely on that has given us comfort or privilege or power that needs to shift. And so into the strife of our day, Jesus speaks once more. And as tempting as it is to use this text to justify the divides that pit us one against the other, we are invited instead to pay attention. To pay attention to our need for help. To pay attention to the reliability of a God who in God's own self experienced brokenness in order to heal brokenness in our world and in our hearts. And Jesus invites us to notice that even when we have grown weary and are ready to give up, God is at work upon us and through us. And although the world tempts us to see the present strife through the lens of that which pits us against each other, to focus on the justification saying one person or one group is better than another, Jesus invites us to see the world through a lens that magnifies our humility, our need to repent, our willingness to let go of something that bolsters us up at the expense of another's well-being. Jesus invites us to be open, to be open to something new, where the wealth of some is less important than the well-being of all, where an economy of grace disrupts the market that views humanity only as labor, where those with no voice are given a seat at the table and said, come on over, sit next to me, you belong. Friends, may we approach the living of our days with our spirits and our senses attuned to the areas of our world in need of loving care of healing transformation, of a reordering 
so that all may know the redemptive love of God. And may we, even when it is hard and uncomfortable, even when it's scary, and even when we just want to hide our head under the covers, may we have the courage and the integrity and the hope and the love to partner with Christ in the season of renewal. For friends, as we say, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are healed. We are made new. Let us live as disciples of the risen Christ. Let us live, even in this time, as a people of love. May it be so. Amen.